Welcome to Climate Watch. I'm Ben Tracy. As of the end of 2023, the Earth has warmed by 2 degrees Fahrenheit from pre-industrial times. That's when global temperature record keeping began. A hotter planet means more severe weather, deadly heat waves and warmer oceans, all of which are endangering plants, animals and insects at an alarming rate. There are more than 1,300 endangered plant and animal species in the United States alone, including the red wolf, native to the southeast, and the Arizona hedgehog cactus. 21 species went extinct in 2023 alone. So we're going to hear from experts about what this means for us humans and some potential solutions to this crisis. We'll travel to a Caribbean forest where a tree with medicinal properties is under threat and can only be studied and used in modern medicine if there is a healthy, abundant population. And we meet a wildlife photographer trying to raise awareness about the critically low population of Florida panthers. But first, what bugs can tell us about the state of our planet? Insects make up two-thirds of the world's 1.5 million animal species. But 40% of insect species are in decline, including the honeybee and the dung beetle. Honeybees experienced mass colony collapse 15 years ago, due in part to pesticides and climate change. And dung beetles are having trouble digging deep enough into the ground to shield their offspring from extreme heat. Adam Yamaguchi met scientists determined to save these creatures. When we run our honeybee business out of our home. Florida beekeeper Alicia Bixler has made it her life's calling to protect honeybees. We rely on them for so much pollination. Apples, almonds, blueberries, pumpkins, avocados, macadamia nuts. Bixler is one of over 100,000 beekeepers in America today who are, in part, responsible for bringing back the number of honeybees from mass colony collapse over 15 years ago. But habitat loss, the use of pesticides, and climate change are threatening other insects of all shapes and sizes. So this is the female. Including the not-so-glamorous dung beetle. This is called the rainbow scarab, and, and you can see that they do look like a puppy dog with their little antennae out. Oh my God. <laughs> and yeah, it just pooped on Yeah, me. it did. <laughs> <laughs> Means it likes you. <laughs> Entomologist Kimberly Sheldon and her team from the University of Tennessee are studying what happens to dung beetles in a warming climate. Are you concerned about beetles and, and what the future holds? I am concerned about beetles. Sheldon collects dung beetles into a greenhouse to better understand how they might fare in the future. However, in the greenhouse, the soil temperatures in that bucket are warmer and more variable. So it's actually realistically simulating what's happening with climate change. But now, Sheldon says smaller dung beetles are having trouble digging deep enough to protect their offspring from the warming climate and extreme temperature swings. A troubling sign for the insects that aerate and provide nutrients in soil. A critical service for agriculture and vegetation. Getting rid of feces, getting rid of dead bodies, getting rid of all the kind of horrible decomposing work is done on this kind of grand scale. We don't really think about it. We don't like to think about it. Writer Oliver Millman, author of the book Insect Crisis, says the massive die-off of insects is as consequential to life on Earth as climate change. The dung beetle, really important disposing of waste that would otherwise carry all kinds of diseases, pathogens that would be passed between animals and humans. And while climate change is contributing to insect population declines, the loss of dung beetles may in turn exacerbate extreme swings in temperature, creating something of a climate doom loop. Do dung beetles serve a function in, let's say, climate regulation? Dung beetles reduce greenhouse gas emissions from things like cow pies. This is endlessly fascinating. I, I had no idea that the dung beetle was this important. I mean, arguably has the worst job in the world. But... Well, I think the dung beetles don't think it's a bad job. <laughs> right, right, right. There's a thing for everybody in this world, and if that's your, you know. Though we often look to animals like the polar bear as the poster child of the climate crisis, according to Millman, insects are just as deserving of our attention. Insects around the world, they're the pilots of the plane. We're at the back, we're the passengers drinking a martini. So they're piloting the plane, we're out back having a drink, but we do have a, a significant impact. Yeah, we are, we're kind of like kicking down the door of the cockpit and messing around with the pilot. We're doing terrible things to their in, uh, environment, habitat destruction. But this is really dry dung. Back in Tennessee, Sheldon says the lowly dung beetle just might be the unsung hero doing its critical duties for the planet. It sounds 
almost foundational for life on Earth. Yeah, that's why people have described insects as the little things that run the world, because they're really that important. We head now to El Yunque National Forest in Puerto Rico. It's home to many endangered plants, including the yellow hibiscus and the Nichols Turk's Head cactus. But one plant, the Tabanuco tree, has the potential to treat some cancers, cardiovascular issues, and neurological diseases. David Schechter has more. There are 154 forests in the National Forest System, none with a larger bounty of plants, animals, and habitats than El Junque National Forest in Puerto Rico. Places like this are medicinal to the soul, to the heart. I'm headed into the forest with park ranger Victor Cuevas and volunteer Michelle Lopez Lorenzo. They're telling me at a time when one million species on the planet are threatened with extinction, that protecting wild places is one of our best defenses to save our living treasures, like the Tabanuco tree, Victor says the sap of the tree has medicinal qualities. Take a pinch. This is, this is newer sap, huh? That's enough. Try it. My whole mouth is now getting numb. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. If you have a cavity, if you have a toothache, this um, was and is one of the many traditional ways also, to remedy that. It also tastes Wonderful. The Tabanuco has long been used in traditional folk medicine, but new research suggests its value as a pharmaceutical is largely untapped, and that the class of trees it belongs to has potential to treat diverse cancers, cardiovascular, and neurological diseases. The Tabanuco still exists today because El Junque was protected against logging and development, and land conservation is helping to protect many other species across the country like the endangered yellow hibiscus, the state flower of Hawaii, and the Nichols Turks Head cactus in Arizona. The only way that the people who are experts in this are going to be able to study these trees is if there's a healthy, abundant population. Today, conserving wild places like El Junque sustains a huge variety of plants and animals that live here. Tomorrow, it might help sustain us with remedies we don't yet know about. From land to the ocean, reef sharks have declined in population by 63% according to a five-year study. And overfishing has driven them to near extinction on 20% of reefs. Marine protected areas, or MPAs, around the world protect animals like the reef shark from human activity, so the rest of the underwater ecosystem can thrive. I visited the Bahamas to see how they're protecting these kings of the coral reef. Here in the Bahamas, reef sharks are one of the most common sharks that we see. Candace Fields took us to Danger Reef in the Bahamas to see this. Waters teeming with reef sharks. As top predators, they're critical to keeping the balance of fish populations in check so coral reef ecosystems can thrive. They're kind of the kings of the coral reef, right? They're keeping the reef in a in nice harmonious balance. Fields is part of a global shark census called FinPrint. In 2018, it found the five main species of reef sharks had declined 63% and were functionally extinct on 20% of the reefs, largely due to overfishing. But they're thriving here inside what is called a marine protected area, or MPA. You can't come in here and fish for anything. You can't take a thing. Absolutely, it's com complete protection. All right, let's check the camera. We watched as Fields deployed an underwater camera to help count the sharks. Her data is part of a new study to see if MPAs help threaten marine life recover. There are more than 18,000 MPAs covering about 8% of the world's oceans, part of a United Nations effort to protect 30% of the oceans by 2030. So we're on our way to look for people fishing. Yes, sir. But enforcement is key. We rode along with the Royal Bahamas Defense Force on patrol. Stop the vessel. It has seized dozens of boats. They have 46 persons on board. Fining and jailing fishermen and confiscating their often massive illegal catch. Either we chase them away or we catch them, and we've been having um, huge success doing this. 
So when it comes to enforcement, you guys are the muscle. Yes. These vessels have entered into the Bahamian waters. Part of the brains of the operation is Skylight, a system that helps track the bad guys using a mix of AI and satellite vessel tracking data. So we're using this technology to help focus those patrol efforts. It's something that I think will have a big impact on shark conservation uh, in the future. Hopefully helping the kings of the reef rebound. Up next, a lizard that has survived for millions of years is losing its habitat as temperatures rise. The Yarrow spiny lizard has been living in and around the Mule Mountains of Arizona for three million years, but now scientists fear they could be extinct as early as next year, as temperatures continue to soar to new record highs. Here again is David Schechter, who went in search of this struggling species. This guy. They're actually, uh, I love them. At just a few inches long. They look like they're smiling all the time. Is called a Yarrow's spiny lizard. Despite his tiny size, he has a huge story to tell about climate change and the very future of our planet. Everyone's got water. Is it bad that I'm already out of breath? We'll take it easy. I'm tagging along on a two hour hike with Dr. John Weens from the University of Arizona to count lizards and document how hotter temperatures are stressing them out. This is some serious stuff. Look, look it's about to flatten out. He says it's about to flatten out, but he's been saying that for an hour. Yarrow's lizards love the cooler mountain habitats across southern Arizona that are well above the hot desert floor. Because they can't take the heat down there, individual populations have been isolated from each other for millions of years in different mountain ranges. Just outside the town of Bisbee, a subpopulation of lizards has lived in the Mule Mountains for three million years. The one here around Bisbee is older than human beings. We anticipate that they're um, going to be entirely extinct here in the Mules by uh, next year, by 2025. They may be extinct already. Why does he think so? Well, in 2014, Weens and his colleagues could only find lizards in the Mule Mountains above 5,700 feet of elevation. Eight years later, he went back, and the only lizards that hadn't died out were now above 7,100 feet. That left only a few hundred feet of mountaintop cool enough for them to survive. So they're almost out of room. A landmark report from the United Nations determined that one million species are threatened with extinction. Based on Dr. Weens' research, he believes that number is actually far higher, driven by the heat-trapping gases that come from our cars, our factories, and our power plants. It's catastrophic. Um, as human beings sort of in, the, in the developed world, we all sort of have some responsibility for this. What do you do to look? We're gonna look on uh, top of rocks here. Um, a little sun is really helpful, but so they'll, they'll be out basking. They're very easy to find when, they're, when it's a sunny day. Does not seem to be anyone here. We need to confirm you come back here at least a couple more times, but it seems like this, this distinct lineage that's been separated for about three million years is, looks like it's gone now. It's gone. Yeah. Is that, is that disappointing to you? Well, yeah, of course. It's, Ultimately, what's the story? This is what the future is going to look like. This is, this is climate-related extinction. Yarrow's spiny lizard populations survive in other parts of Arizona, though many are struggling too. Damn. Ween says the death of this local population around Bisbee shows us how climate change is quickening the pace of extinction. It's not only happening over centuries or decades, it's happening now. The population of Florida panthers has risen from only 20 or 30 total in the 1970s to roughly 200 today. Bipartisan conservation efforts like the Florida Wildlife Corridor connecting their native habitats have helped their numbers grow, but there's still much more to be done. Manuel Bajorquez followed along with a wildlife photographer raising awareness of the so-called ghost cat. A panther just walked out. Reclusive and elusive, the Florida panther is often called the ghost cat. 
To see one, it's either a zoo or the rare and accidental encounter. Oh my god. Oh my god. Holy sh. I've only ever seen two Florida Panthers in the wild with my own eyes. They're that elusive. They're completely elusive. There could be one looking at us somewhere in these cypress trees right now, yeah, but we'll never see it. This project has been the hardest thing I've ever attempted. Wildlife photographer Carlton Ward has been hunting panthers digitally for 20 years. With elaborate camera traps in the swampy wilds, Ward has captured panther images as never before. The new Nat Geo film intimately showcases the struggle for survival. Panthers need a lot of land. A single male panther needs a home range of up to 200 square miles. That's four times the size of Miami for a single panther. We met Ward at the edge of what's called the Florida Wildlife Corridor, a project he founded. It's a mosaic of still wild and undeveloped land stitched together and occasionally assisted with infrastructure. He says it's the vital link in the panther's survival story. It takes all the adjacent properties working together as a connected whole because it takes the nature preserve and the cattle ranch and the citrus grove and the timber farm and the state forest all together as this connected green space that panthers call home. Human conflict drove panthers to the brink. First, livestock ranchers removed big cats by any means necessary. East of the Mississippi, panthers were eventually driven into a tiny swampy corner of Florida. Next came rampant urban sprawl and the often fatal encounters that came with it. Vehicle collision is number one, but in the last two weeks we have three. The ghost cat almost vanished entirely. In the early 80s and 1990s, there were probably only about 20 to 30 Florida panthers left in the wild. I mean, that's pretty close to extinct. Yeah, it's about as close as you can get. Dave Honorado is a panther biologist with Florida Fish and Wildlife. He's among the conservationists that helped bring them back from the brink. It looks like wilderness, but we're not very far from I-75. No, pumas and panthers are amazingly adaptable, and so they will come up to what we call the urban wildlife interface. But to survive, the cats may need to go further. For decades, the imposing Caloosahatchee River prevented panthers from moving north of the Everglades. And that had been the dividing line for five decades, where no female panthers had been seen north of that river since 1973. So we've had nothing, nothing break the beam since last Friday. But then a small miracle, somehow, a female panther north of the river nicknamed Babs. She's amazing. She's a pioneer. She swam the river. For Ward, Babs became an obsession. Why is it so important for you to capture a crystal clear, beautiful image? People connect with beauty. People connect with their hearts. And to see the eyes of these panthers and to see the beauty of the habitat and the place where they live. Now, with their numbers creeping above 200, Florida panthers have a new and unlikely ally. Come in. Yes, cattle ranchers. At least some ranchers, like Elton Langford. Protecting the panther also protects your way of life. Yes, sir, it does. He says the same development that threatens panthers might make ranchers an endangered species. If you lose in habitat, you lose in everything. You know, if you think about it, we need to do our part as good stewards of the land. Ward hopes the tide may finally be turning. It is not California, it is not Texas, it is Florida. Public opposition helped defeat a toll road once proposed right through panther territory. And there has been bipartisan government support and funding for the corridor. And Babs, well, here she is with one of her many cubs. It's believed she's already delivered multiple litters north of that river. I want people to know that this Florida still exists, that we have wilderness and wild places that are as beautiful and inspiring as any place in the world. And then we have animals like the Florida Panther that are still out there and need us for their survival. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news, stream us right here on CBS News 24 7, available across all platforms. Thanks for watching Climate Watch. I'm Ben Tracy.